zero. Welcome everybody to our session today, which will be focusing on the tools of upstream technology governance, soft law, standards, and ethics by design. My name is Julia Black. I'm a professor of law at the London School of Economics and Political Science. And I'm also president of the British Academy, which is the UK's National Academy for Social Sciences and Humanities. My own area of work specializes and focuses in regulation uh, of different areas and different domains. And the issues of technology governance are ones which have are probably always been with us and will continue to be. But certainly the challenges that they pose are can be quite significant. And we know that those challenges can vary with the different types of technology involved, whether it's a hard science, engineering technology, whether it's in life sciences, whether it's in digital. But overall, the question that we're always seeking the answer to and trying to address is the same from a governance point of view, which is how can we ensure that technologies are developed in a way which means that they are socially useful, they are socially responsible, and they are socially trustworthy. Who is responsible for ensuring that those goals are met? And what is it that they should be doing? So those are some of the issues I'm hoping we're going to be exploring in our panel today. And I have to say, I'm extremely excited to be moderating this panel. I think it's a fantastic panel that we have uh, with us with an incredible range of roles and experiences and views. And so I'm going to ask each panel to, to reflect um, in turn on how their own work helps align technology governance with societal goals. Um, now, each of my speakers has the most amazing CVs. I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves and just do a few selected highlights uh, from those otherwise very extensive CVs, which I'm sure we have uh, copies of. Uh, we'll have a general discussion across the panel, and then we'll be opening up the questions and uh, you know the format of how to, to put those through. So we have a lot to get through. Uh, as ever, we have um, probably too much to get through in the time that we have available. So I'm going to start right away without further ado and i'm going to and i'm going to turn to you first if i may to ask you that core question how how your work helps align technology governance with societal goals thank you thank you uh julia and uh yes my name is andrew wyckoff i'm the director of science technology and innovation at the oecd um Probably the most relevant thing in my past uh, for the session today is I used to work at the U.S. Congressional Office of Technology Assessment, uh, which used to provide uh, scientific and technological advice to the U.S. Congress. Um, at, uh, hopefully it's obvious why the OECD thinks this is a, a, a relevant uh, topic and one worthy of, of discussion. I, I'm fresh back from London, Julia, mm -hmm. just uh, last week. Um, where, as Minister Philp said in the introduction, along with my Secretary General, this is a really a core issue that many countries are, are grappling with. And it's, it's much more than just the G7. That's just, I think, the tip of the iceberg, really. Um, and everywhere I go, you hear calls for safety or ethics or human rights by design. And, and I never really hear the follow-up. What, what does that design process look like? And I think this is some of the questions uh, that we have. Uh, okay, who does the design? Who ensures it's right? And then who follows up to make sure that those plans are actually what, what is implemented? And I guess I would just say this isn't really a new concern for the OECD. I, I've, I've been there a while and I, I wasn't there in 1980, but in 1980, we passed what were really some of the first privacy guidelines. Uh, in 85, we were looking at transborder data flows, believe it or, 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 or not. And then you fast forward to the 2000s. And in 2007, we did best practice guide, guidelines for, for biological research centers, including biosecurity. And then most recently, probably what we're best known for are the um, council recommendation, which is OECD talk for soft law mm -hmm. on uh, neurotechnology uh, principles, responsible innovation on neurotechnology, as well as in 2019, our principles on artificial um, intelligence. And in one way or another, and Duncan Caspegs referred to this, but in my part of the OECD as well, we've been doing kind of horizon scanning of technologies that we think will have a major uh, impact on public policies. We do this through what we call our outlooks, which hopefully look out. 
and and look at some of the technologies coming in, such as 3D printing and industrial biotech, and new materials and and big data and things like blockchain and quantum computing and so so forth. But to be fair, these these efforts have really been sporadic and have not been systematic. Um, that said, I think we've learned a few lessons. So just to answer your question, let me use our work on artificial intelligence to kind of fill in, I think, some of the lessons we've learned, but I, I welcome the reaction of, of people on this panel and beyond. Um, if you just look at our work on artificial intelligence, really, it started again with the G7 meeting, this time in Takamatsu in 2016. We followed that up with a scoping conference in 2017, a little bit like what we're doing uh, here. Uh, it would cover two days with 10 sessions and try to look at the breadth of how AI may affect things. We then um, convoked a, a multi-stakeholder uh, expert group because in the secretariat, we love technology, but we're not computer scientists by and large, a few. Um, uh, and that they came together and produced um, what were the draft principles on artificial intelligence. These then went to more formal bodies, the committee, and eventually the OECD council, who then um, approved them. And, you know, principles, I think, are important. Um, they're not binding, uh, but they do carry moral and political suasion. And I think when a technology is early on, they have kind of paint lines on the road that you stay between. So we stay out of each other's way, but still yeah. give a fair amount of freedom and mm -hmm. scope for innovation. Let me then quickly take you into step five, because it's been a lot of the conversation today uh, and yesterday, and that is about implementation. Principles are great, but what about putting them into practice? And here we've done a number of things. Uh, we've, again, reconvoked this multi-stakeholder expert group, broken into four different sessions, groups, uh, partnering with, with uh, institutions like Kevin's at, at MIT and beyond uh, to, to come up with real practical tools that can help uh, achieve some of the goals of AI by minimizing the risks. We have an observatory that uh, looks broadly at the policies um, so that we can learn from, from each other. And then we also host the Global Partnership on AI, which again came out of the Canadian and French presidencies of the G7. Let me just end because I'm, I'm, I'm running out of time. But I just want to say, I think we've learned a lot. We've made some pretty good progress. It certainly isn't done, but this is just one technology. Yeah. <laughs> so, and so the, the question is, how do we scale this up? How do you make something more systematic? Clearly there's other technologies such as biotechnology that, that deserve similar uh, attention. Um, and also means systematizing, I think some of the work we've been doing on horizon scan. Thanks. Uh, that's fascinating. Thank you so much. So it's, I mean, incredibly um, fantastic introduction, but also really interesting to hear the lessons that you've drawn on to in bringing together those different stakeholders on that international uh, and global level, and also uh, bringing those different multiple perspectives, you say, to develop um, something quite important. So could I turn at Gary now to you um, and ask you as well to, to just reflect on, on how the work that you do can help us really ensure that we've got very strong societal governance around technology. Yeah, great. So I'm delighted to be part of this uh, interesting discussion. Um, I'm a law professor in, at Arizona State University in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, and uh, before coming to academia, I spent 10 years as a regulatory lawyer in Washington, D.C. and was very frustrated by all the pathologies and, and inadequacies and ineffectiveness of regulatory systems. Uh, nobody was getting what they wanted. Uh, There's all kinds of inefficiencies, all kinds of just people fighting, and uh, nobody was getting uh, the type of uh, results that often there was agreement on, but they couldn't get there. Uh, and so I was very frustrated with that and decided to go into academia. And so the last 20 years have been working on alternate forms of governance. Um, uh, so I, I convene an annual conference every May for the last 10 years called Governance Emerging Technologies and, and Societies, where the idea is to look across technologies of different governance innovations and see how they're working. So our last one before COVID, uh, we've had the last two canceled because of COVID, but we had, I think, speakers on 60 different technologies and the governance. And there's just all kinds of cross-learning going on of how 
you know, people trying something with this technology might work for that technology. And so um, that's really excited me in terms of, you know, just the amount of innovation in the governance space. There's so many interesting and creative and innovative people coming out with ideas. Um, my particular area I've been doing a lot of work on is soft law, as, as Andrew was talking about, uh, which I define as uh, commitments and obligations that are not directly uh, enforceable by government. And, um, you know, I think soft law is inevitable and, and essential part of the, the governance spectrum for emerging technologies, either because some cases there just isn't going to be regulation and, and probably shouldn't be because of how fast the technology is moving or it's addressing issues that are outside the realm of any government regulatory agency. Other times it's a gap filler until there is government regulation. We need something in the interim that's much uh, faster to put in place. Uh, so it's an inevitable part of the, of the, uh, uh, the ecosystem is not the only thing. Obviously, we, government regulation continues and will always be a, a very important part of the, the, the ecosystem, but soft law is critical. So what I'm interested in is, is why uh, and when does this work and when does it not? So part of my research is looking empirically at in the historical examples of soft law. When does it work? When does it not? And what are the factors that explain that? And, and I think we have ideas. Uh, you know, the majority of soft law programs aren't successful, really. Uh, there are some that are, though. What can we learn from that? And then looking forward, how can we make soft law more effective and more credible? Uh, so one of the projects we have now is looking at uh, 634 AI soft law programs, which we've analyzed across 107 different criteria, and it's all available online in a publicly available database, and, and drawing lessons from that of, of what, you know, will work and what won't work. And so, you know, one of the interesting findings is it's like two thirds of these soft law programs have no follow up or implementation requirement. Just put out the principles. And as Andrew said, that's a good first step, but you need some kind of implementation or enforcement mechanism. And two thirds of them don't have that. There might be something out there, they just don't say it, but most of them don't seem to have anything. Um, and then uh, thinking about what kinds of implementation tools available. So we've, we've created sort of a toolbox of, of ideas to try to indirectly enforce soft law programs, insurance, um, uh, trade associations, uh, collaborations, um, uh, liability. Uh, and we have a whole list of these that we're, we're evaluating for different examples. So to look empirically of how can we make this better, given it's going to be essential part of the governance spectrum for all these new emerging technologies. Oh, listen, that's fascinating. And I'm sure people will be Googling onto your open source platform right now. That's the, that's the wonders of being able to do these things uh, in this way. But I think it's imp really important to have that breadth. Um, looking across, you say, all those multiple technologies, but also the different, you know, to gather, it, to gather in those empirical examples of what really can work and what not in different circumstances. It would be great to explore that a little bit more. Um, but Bowman, I'm going, to, I'm going to turn to you now. You work in the area of, of health, and it would be really fascinating to hear from your perspective. How, how you think we can address some of these challenges. Yes, hi, Julia, thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Boma Brown-West. I'm the Director of Consumer Health at Environmental Defense Fund, um, also known as EDF. And um, EDF is uh, one of the world's leading environmental organizations. We've um, been around for um, over 50 years. And um, what we do, we use science, economics, partnerships, and advocacy um, to work towards healthier communities and a healthier planet. Mm -hmm. I specifically sit on our EDF Plus business team, which is the corporate engagement arm of EDF. So as Gary was talking about soft law, that's very much the um, area that I operate in. Um, and in our approach, uh, we try to leverage the power of the marketplace mm -hmm. to help us achieve environmental results. Um, and we um, partner with and collaborate with high impact companies um, that have vast, uh, you know, vast power um, throughout multiple supply chains or sectors to help them transform their own operations um, and supply chain, but also to scale across entire sectors. Um, and honestly, we do this because um, the science has been pretty clear that business as usual is exacting a huge toll on the planet and on our health. Mm -hmm. So in my work, I focus on reducing the climate and health impacts of consumer products mm -hmm. uh, because products and including food um, from sourcing to disposal are the single biggest source of environmental impact in our modern world. 
uh, and they could contributing to climate change, um, causing resource destruction and exposing all of us to toxic chemicals. So as um, we're looking at our global population growing, um, this whole concept of consumerism, this growth of consumer products, it's not going away, right? Um, the impacts are becoming ever more serious. Uh, and so a lot of my work is around how do we, um, how do we uh, continue to create consumer products, but in a way where we're minimizing exposure to toxic chemicals, and we're minimizing um, the impact to our natural resources um, and also trying to um, uh, minimize the brunt on communities that have suffered the most from the creation, um, use and disposal of, um, of uh, products. And I think that there's a huge opportunity here for technology developers and product innovators. Um, and, uh, but you really do need on one hand, um, you do need a strong regulatory framework. That's very important. But um, we've also realized, especially because there's so many across jurisdictions, there's just so many differences in terms of how those frameworks are applied um, that you really need um, corporate leadership going above and beyond and being proactive. So that's really where um, I concentrate a lot of my work in terms of what can companies do on their own, what can they do in collaboration with each other to set some, um, you know, some rules, execute um, some rules that help us try to minimize the um, impacts of products and create more sustainable, safer, and circular products and supply chains. Fantastic, fascinating. I look forward to hearing more as we as we proceed as we move on through the discussion. Um, but first, Kevin, I'm going, I'm going to turn to you for your perspective. On, on your work and how that contributes, as I say, to ensuring that we can get uh, societal governance over, over technologies. Thank you, Julia. So I'm Kevin Esfeldt. I'm an evolutionary engineer and inventor, and I run a biotech group at MIT Media Lab. Now, my group is called Sculpting Evolution, and that's in part because we harness evolution as a tool to build molecular tools that we couldn't actually rationally design. And then we use those tools to actually change the characteristics of organisms in the laboratory that can be released in order to controllably change the traits of a wild population, among many other things. So you might say, well, okay, why if you build synthetic ecosystems and so forth, why are you at the MIT Media Lab? And the answer is sculpting evolution isn't just about sculpting biological evolution. It's about trying to sculpt the evolution of technology because at the end of the day, that is what matters for society. I got into this because I played a very minor role in developing CRISPR genome editing, but it wasn't long after that that I realized we could program organisms to do genome editing on their own. Mm -hmm. This allows us to build what's called a gene drive, mm -hmm. which is a system that if released, will spread on its own through a wild population. And if we're not careful, it could affect the whole species. Now, this is something where, as best I can tell, being a huge science fiction buff, there were no existing examples where anyone had even imagined that many people would be able to change the traits of a whole wild species. Yeah. So I found it pretty terrifying that the first time humanity thought of this, we realized exactly how to do it. And it turned out we can do it mm -hmm. many years later but we weren't really prepared for it. So I spent a lot of time trying to figure out, is this going to be used as a weapon? Could it be used as a weapon? Should we tell the world? Who gets a say in how these technologies are developed? Can scientists use it safely? Because if we engineer an organism with a gene drive, full power version, and it gets out, it could spread on its own. What would that do to public trust? Because this is also a technology that is, might be one of our best hopes for ending malaria. Yeah. So what we decided to do was, well, first of all, it's not a very effective weapon, but I would not say that of the rest of biotechnology. So I devoted my, my laboratory and career to this challenge of safeguarding biotech against yeah. mistrust and misuse. And what I would love to do would be to require all of my colleagues to not only use necessary safeguards, but to actually go to communities before they even begin research in the lab on an application and say, hey, we think you have this problem. 
are you interested enough that you might be willing to work with us to come up with a new biotech solution to this problem? Here are the different ways that we could go about it. Which one would you like? And will you work with us to develop one or the other? Or feel free to tell us to walk away. We'd rather know now than later. But I don't have the power to require everyone to do that. What we would need is the journals and the funders to actually require folks to do that and to invite feedback from the communities who would be affected by these technologies, who otherwise will be denied a voice if we do science as usual. Yeah. So what we do is try to set a positive example by mm -hmm. working with communities that we think have these problems. And we chose Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard for very well-educated and politically powerful communities, sort of an easy start with New England town hall democracy. And they've been advising us on how to engineer the white-footed mice that infect ticks with Lyme disease, because they have some mm -hmm. of the highest rates of Lyme disease in the world. So they might be interested in engineering the mice so that they can no longer transmit the disease. Also on the other side of the world, we're interested in getting rid of rodenticides and replacing them with much more humane versions in which the rodents just don't reproduce as much. And this could be very useful for conservation because rodents are a huge pest. So we reached out to the Maori on the other side of the world in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and asked them to guide our research on developing this technology. Because even though we wanna use it in urban areas for the most part, and maybe in agriculture eventually, we recognize it will probably be used in places like Aotearoa. So we wanted to hear from Maori about how their values could shape what the system should end up looking like. And then finally, I do a lot of work on preventing the direct misuse of biotech. Um, and in particular, building ways to screen all DNA synthesis around the world for hazards that might be used to let people make, for example, new pandemics. Very topical. Um, and again, lots that we could delve into there, but absolutely fascinating to think about that, that sort of hyper upstream, as it were, before, even in, in terms of the framing of the scientific questions rather than the, the how do we, um, how do we use uh, social science humanities as a way to kind of put lipstick on the stem pig? <laughs> so we're in terms of, you know, we created something, so how do we then make that thing we created socially acceptable, but actually to bring that, that, that discourse and that discussion, that deliberation right into the question of what should we make, as it were. Very simplistically put. Fantastic, really, really fascinating. Um, so moving around now to Julien, your, your own work is again in a in a different area but you work um with the who for example on digital health and it would be fascinating to learn from your perspective um the way that you think that your work helps us to really align technology governance with the types of goals that society is trying to see absolutely julia um so i'm originally an engineer and a lawyer by training and specializing in corporate governance and ethics uh, on the one hand and on the other hand, uh, having a specialty on advanced health technologies. And so I'm trying to also mix those two topics, particularly in the field of health uh, ethics and, and advanced uh, ethics of technologies. Um, I, I am currently the chief ethics and business integrity officer for Sanofi, a uh, biopharmaceutical company. I'm also um, actively contributing at IFPMA, which is the Global Trade Association for the biopharmaceutical industry. We're grouping the 2 million employees in the world and producing self-regulation for those 2 million employees, which are actively working to find and develop new treatments to save lives. Um, and you mentioned it, I'm also um, uh, actively working uh, for WHO as an expert on digital health technologies. And I'm a non-executive chairman of uh, digital health uh, ventures, which is also giving me a unique uh, insight in those emerging technologies that Andrew was talking about earlier. So maybe two angles, I would say a company angle and an industry angle. Um, the sure. first uh, you know, angle, which I, I find quite fascinating, is working for a large biopharmaceutical company. I don't think there is a more noble purpose in life than working for a company which is developing, manufacturing and distributing health technology to save patient lives. Uh, and and you know, that's a great opportunity to use those health technology to literally transform the practice of medicine find new pathways, find new drug mechanism, uh, work beyond the pills, uh, understand the needs of patients and the entire healthcare ecosystem, healthcare professional, healthcare providers, payers, healthcare authorities, and so on. Uh, and so that's a, a unique opportunity. And so what we're doing is we're organizing ourselves as a purpose-led 
enterprise, which means that we're putting ethics and integrity at the heart of everything we do, even using it as a strategic differentiator. Because if you're a patient or a healthcare professional, you want to make sure that you trust the technology which you know are put you know to the, you know onto the market and brought uh, to you in order to save or extend your life. And so you want to make sure that there is a trust established, and that goes all the way back to what we call ethics by design in health technology. And so that's something we do every day. Um, it's a lot of hard work. Uh, because as you can imagine, more than in any other sectors, uh, when it's about putting a drug into you know, a patient's body in order to either extend their life or save their life, the societal expectations are greater than in any other sectors of activities. And therefore, we believe that ethics, business integrity, and ethics of technology should be greater than in any other sector. And so we do have to comply with a large uh, you know, uh, array of, of, of regulation. But as you know as well, um, technology, and particularly when it comes to health technology, but also the use of non-health technology in the healthcare sector are exponential. And the problem is regulation are linear. And so that's creating more and more what I call the growing gray. And so we used to navigate 10 or 20 years ago from a health technology perspective in a quasi black and white environment. Mm -hmm. Now we have a lot of gray. And so that's more and more important to move to self-regulation, ethics by design, co-regulation. Uh, and that leads to my, uh, my other uh, point, which is around industry level type of, uh, of work. Uh, here we work particularly at IFPMA very actively with the trade association to design new code of ethics for the industry. There I'm chairing the Global Future Health Technology Ethics Commission and I'm co-chairing the Global Bioethics uh, Commission where we're really looking at an industry level. What is the next generation of risk that could occur with those technologies as well as the next generation opportunities as well because we could save lives and we've seen you know in COVID times the ability of an entire industry to try to find you know the application of new technology to you know help patients in the pandemic and and that's a unique purpose as well and so how can we co-design together as an industry uh, which is very important and be ahead of the game so that we can produce the next generation standard as well as the next generation standard for ethics by design of those technology with a subsequent protocol uh, and of course co-design with the patients and the entire mm -hmm. ecosystem and, and think ahead how we can actually change the world and particularly the healthcare ecosystem. Back to you Julia. Brilliant. Thank you so much Julia. Um, and then uh, Stefan finally over, over to you from a Again, quite a distinct perspective uh, on, on how we can actually be governing technology in the way that we want to achieve. We've, had, we've heard from multiple different players. We've got a multinational perspective, we've got an industry perspective, a direct science perspective, a more NGO perspective. Let's, let's hear from you on your, your role and your thoughts. Thanks a lot, Julia, and uh, thanks a lot for the invitation to this uh, really distinguished and, and very exciting panel with all of its different views. And I think my view might be another different view to, to this issue. Since I'm coming from the regulatory world, um, mm -hmm. I'm working at the Federal Chancellery in Berlin, Germany. Um, I'm, uh, I have been for 10 years with the business sector, including startup experience, uh, etc. But for more than 15 years now, I'm working on the issue of the quality of law and how to further develop the, the quality of regulation. And here in this context uh, might be relevant that I'm also the chair of the regulatory policy committee of the OECD, where we work on a uh, number of regulatory issues um, we had the pleasure already, Andrew, to work together with your directorate. Uh, that's always uh, great to interconnect uh, the communities at the OECD. And um, I, I think I don't need to, to say anything about innovation. Um, however, innovation is a challenge for regulators. And perhaps, Gary, that would be the first chance to, um, to talk about the myth because there is outside the regulatory world, often there is this um, expectation that every innovation, every technology needs its regulation. And I think that's a myth and that's wrong because regulation usually is um, intended to be general 
to be abstract, to, to give general guidelines. So the, the question is, how does anything, what is new at the market, how does an innovation um, relates to this general um, framework, and which is an expression of uh, political preferences and of, uh, in, at least in our countries, of democratic choice. So it's first is a question, does the regulatory framework apply effectively? And there might be sometimes innovations which by intention or by bad luck uh, uh, avoid the, the, the regulatory framework. And that's the very point where the regulators are called and expected to further develop the regulatory framework to make sure that general rules apply to real life and are not, not meaningless. So in light of all of these challenges and opportunities related to innovation, on 6th of October this year, the OECD Council at ministerial level has adopted a recommendation for agile regulatory governance to harness information on the proposal of the regulatory policy committee. And this complements existing OECD recommendations and best practice principles pertaining to better regulations, uh, as well as normative work in other relevant areas, such as digital government strategies, open government, artificial intelligence, and responsible innovation in neurotechnology, as Andrew has already mentioned. Its main aim uh, the, the, main, the main aim of the recommendation is to help policymakers unlock the potential of technology and innovation while safeguarding public well-being. Each, for example, by engaging in particularly in co-design when regulating or, for example, by engaging in strategic foresight um, to inform policymakers and politicians um, to, and, and this is particularly relevant because um, all regulation is, uh, is, uh, is an attempt to change the future. Mm -hmm. We want, there is a call for regulation if you want something to be different in future. And for that reason, it's so important really to engage in, in, in our toolbox to, to work with future. The adoption of the recommendation creates a strong momentum for regulatory reforms towards more agile and forward-looking approaches to innovation and confers a strong mandate to the regulatory policy committee to further pursue work in this area. All the more since the development of the recommendation has also shown its timeliness and relevance by supporting the broader G7 and G20 agendas. And as you may know, the declaration of G20 digital ministers of 5th of August acknowledges the contribution of the recommendation as well as the survey on HR regulation developed by the OECD. So one of the principles in, in this uh, recommendation is um, the opportunity uh, to, to, to utilize the opportunities provided by non-legally binding approaches either as an alternative or as a complement to other regulatory instruments. However, certain preconditions must, from our point of view, be met when resorting to this kind of arrangements, such as the existence of uh, sufficient alignment between businesses and government's interests, meaningful consultation with those concerned, which is a challenge for standardization processes usually, a level playing field for all innovators, including SMEs, and might be relevant to keep in mind that SMEs usually don't have the resources and don't have the ca capacity to contribute effectively to standardization. So standardization should not remain just a party of the big ones, but it needs to invest in outreach. And as we have heard, um, at the same time, companies referring to these standards should be encouraged to demonstrate their commitment to fair and ethical behavior, which will in turn help build the trust of governments and the public more broadly. 
Um, going forward, it will be essential to bear in mind that the case for resorting on non-legally binding options should be grounded on evidence, should be effectively be effectively open to all parties concerned, and should be communicated clearly from the outset. Standardization should not be a secret science. And I borrow a sentence um, from Fighting Corruption, where uh, I learned this very nice saying, sunlight is the best detergent. And sunlight is also the best motor for uh, innovation. The OECD, and particularly the Regulatory Policy Committee, with our partnership of about 50 international organizations, intend to promote and facilitate, facilitate this kind of exchange as much as possible as the recommendation for HR regulatory governance to harness innovation enters in its implementation phase. With that, for the moment, uh, Julia, back to you. Oh, fantastic. Thank you, Stefan. Um, fascinating insights there, as you say, from a regulatory perspective and looking at some of those preconditions um, for, for effectiveness of different types of regulatory regimes, particularly in this case, the soft law and standards. So, so listen, we've ranged from uh, G7 down to scientists in the lab. We've ranged across industries, marketplaces, supply chains, trade bodies, um, through to, to actually the DNA of a company itself when it's switched to and it's moved to, to being um, focused on profiting from, as we said, the British Academy, um, profiting from solving problems rather than profiting from creating them uh, in how it's uh, designed their purpose. So. So I want to, there are a long, number of different ways that we can um, sort of approach some of these questions. But one of the, the things I've been very struck by for all of, across all of you, uh, most of you, is the emphasis on co-design and the emphasis on moving that focus further upstream. Uh, and regulators, down the setters or others, or Kevin, in your case, scientists directly working with um, different societal groups, working with regulators, working with industry. And I'm wondering, um, what, what do you think makes that up? How, well, first of all, how important is it to get that upstream engagement? I think the answer to that question is probably fairly straightforward because you're all emphasized, I think probably very, very important. Um, but most importantly, how do we make that effective? How do we get that upstream engagement and that co design to be really effective? I mean, Stefan, you mentioned, for example, you know, SMEs can't always engage, you know, there's obviously capacity issues about different participants. Um, in, in the sector, in the in the different activities in the kind of regulatory space that we're to be able to engage. So how do we really make that work? Um, so perhaps Julian, perhaps I can start with, with you because you're you're doing that as it were in the context of, of a company and in context of the industry. Oh you'll have to come off mute. And then Kevin, I'm going to turn to you because I know you're absolutely Julia, you... Great. Uh, no, no, I think that's a, a phenomenal question, Julia. And uh, that's indeed what we um, spend a lot of our energy and time every day doing. Uh, I think upstream, when you are um, a, a, an industry provider of advanced health technologies, right, uh, means that you have to look at the different stage of development of such a technology uh, in-house. So let's start with that perspective first. The ideation, then you prototype, you know, to a minimum viable product, then you're going to pilot, then you're going to scale it, right? And I think what is very important is embed the ethics by design and all the societal expectation, whether that's privacy, ethics, diversity and inclusion, and all technological requirement upstream in all the different stage of that design through very you know, simple but clear protocol. We, for example, have developed what we call privacy impact assessment, safety impact assessment, quality impact assessment, diversity, inclusion, privacy, and human rights assessment. Imagine, for example, you're developing an advanced artificial intelligence solution that allow you to diagnose potential disease if they're not properly trained on the right data set or if they're not using the right technology to actually, you might end up actually from a diversity and inclusion, not diagnosing in certain type of population of disease or misdiagnosing it. Mm. But it's very important that we do that with the right protocol. Uh, and, and I think we the problem with innovation is if you put too much governance around a regulation, you're mm. not going to innovate enough. But if you yeah. don't put enough governance around regulation, then you're not getting around technology, then you won't have enough ethical 
successful output. So it's about striking yeah. the right middle ground so that you can be ethical in your design, but unleash the potential of innovation. And then from an industry perspective, the upstream is the same, except as you know, as opposed to a company focusing on you know product and services from a health technology perspective. At an industry level, when we co-design the code, what we're doing now systematically is reach out to patient associations, mm -hmm. reach out to health authority and regulators, mm -hmm. reach out to partners, philosophers, uh, you know, university professors, etc. Society that gives us input in the very design of our future self-regulation, mm -hmm. so that we can do it together. It's much more powerful. It's an industry that is in the past, you know, uh, you know, as I suffered from the fact that people think it's a black box, the more transparent, the more we co-design, you know, the more open we are, the more likely the trust will be established among all of us. And the more likely the health technology solution we produce are going to be accepted and then use at scale to save and enhance patient lives. Fantastic. Kevin, can I, um, could I turn to you? Because also I know you need to go uh, in a few minutes time, but I think some of the work that you've taken on voluntarily across, across your lab to for that very deep community engagement is fascinating. And I'm wondering what you're hearing from an, and from the industry perspective, from others' perspectives as to, again, how that resonates with you in terms of how viable any of that is. Um, but also from your perspective, you mentioned a few levers. We often talk about third party levers in regulatory systems who aren't directly involved, but have kind of leverage over those that we really do want to regulate. And you mentioned, for example, journals or or others kind of peer review processes. So, so what in, in, in the activities that you're engaging in and the way that you're trying to bring that deliberative democracy di directly into the scientific process are, are things that uh, we need to really focus on to enable that to be strengthened and embedded and, and scaled. Yeah, so this is, the, this is the real challenge in that, first of all, I should say we, we don't do a lot of stuff with industry. Yeah. Um, in fact, in part, I'm trying to keep gene drive technology as nonprofit as possible for as long as possible, mm -hmm. at least until we get early applications done, because we don't want another GMO mess. Yeah. And I think everyone is united in agreeing that we don't want another GMO mess. And actually, we've put in a lot of IP protections in place, leveraging all the relevant IP that we and others have filed to ensure that there is no industry use of CRISPR-based gene drive in a for-profit manner at least until the nonprofit applications against things like malaria and other diseases have a chance to go forwards. So that's just a trying to promote public trust in the technology um, by ensuring that the obviously public health implications are, are realized first. But how do you, but how do you do that? How do you, in, mm. how do you nudge people towards some areas and not others? Mm. And how can you ensure that the academics then that are developing the, these kinds of technologies as far upstream as possible, like the effects on society are wildly different depending on whether you go down one yeah. branch of the technology tree yeah. or another. How do you yeah. nudge the academics into noticing that there are downstream consequences yeah. of one versus the other, let alone figure out what they are, and then yeah. actually choose to go down one versus another? That's a lot to ask because, you know, my colleagues also have to be at the cutting edge, stay abreast of everything that's going on, Come up with you know identify the branches in the first place and figure out how to how to move along them so you really need to change their incentives and i think you want to change the incentives in ways that similarly don't require new regulations we all hate additional paperwork so i think the key here is transparency right academics trust peer review we accept that we need peer review because we're so mm -hmm. often wrong and there's nothing worse than getting a really nasty scathing peer review decision in which reviewer three not only rips apart your paper, but they're right. They said you should have done it this way and that way and the other way. And you think, damn it, why didn't you tell me that three years ago? <laughs> so I think that if we could change the incentives yeah. to encourage us to disclose our ideas and our early prototype plans at the beginning of a project and invite peer review then, and especially for things like eco-technologies that change a shared environment that people won't be able to opt out of, that's when you also invite the communities in. So how do you get the scientists to do that? Well, most of my colleagues are perfectly willing to do that if you actually fund them to do it. Yeah. Right? You're asking them to spend a bunch of their time going out and talking to communities rather than spending time in the lab. 
So you need to get the funders to provide supports to actually do the right thing. Yeah. You also need the incentives to actually risk sharing your idea early on and risk having it get scooped by someone who throws more money in hands at the problem, publishes first and gets all the credit. Yeah. So preprints here can actually help. If you publish the idea first, then you can always at least point to it and say, well, we came up with the idea first, even if Mr. Moneybags over there actually did it. Yeah. But really you need the funders and the journals, which are the key incentivizers for academics yeah. to just require initially that, and the funders incentivized by paying for it, the researchers to share their plans early on, including with communities for eco-technologies. And the problem is I've been trying to get them to do this for a long time. They're slowly coming around, but there's no coordination mechanism. Each of them might be willing to do it individually, but it's a collective action problem. How do you get them all to agree to do it all together when you can't necessarily get them all in the same room? So what we need is some, something like WHO to create a registry for gene drive experiments initially. And then funders and journals can point to that and say, hey, this registry requires that you approach a community before you begin the lab experiments for an application. It requires that you share all of your safeguards and what you're planning to do in order to register. And you can't actually get your funding confirmed or eventually publish the results unless you register. And that's yeah. something that again, only the funders and journals can do. But if there's a registry that has the requirements and they can say, you gotta register, then problem solved. So that's what I would love to see. And I think that could actually make research go faster because it would force us to share early on, identify yeah. the problems early on. And then that tells our competitors what we're doing, which gives them ideas of how to do things even dif differently and ideally better. Mm -hmm. And ideally everything beneficial goes faster but we'll mm -hmm. also have a chance for folks outside the field to say, hey, wait a minute, did you know that pandemic virus prediction, to give one example, yeah. effectively shares credible and accessible weapons of mass destruction with the entire world? And maybe we should not do that. Because if you just keep the people in the field working on the problem without any oversight from anyone else, they're not gonna notice things like that. And I can tell you yeah. that because that's my current crusade. People are doing that. And they have no idea that someone might actually misuse that kind of knowledge. They have no idea that that's the limiting factor preventing people from making pandemics now. So earlier transparency can help us accelerate the good stuff and stave off the bad directions. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Kevin. Um, and I hear that very loud and clearly. Let's change the, the funding and the incentive, not the forms, right? <laughs> In terms of what it is. But that collective action issue. And um, so, a number of we're gathering a number of thoughts here now as to how to get that upstream kind of co-design um rendered effective and when you're working you said you're working in the market you're working with supply chains you're working with industry so from from your perspective what are the things that you've seen work really effectively in that in that early stage kind of co-design bringing bringing these issues upstream for decision and determination what works well yeah, I do think um, having multiple stakeholders involved is key. I think we've heard a little bit about that already today. Um, it can't simply be the um, inventors who are trying to anticipate these, um, you know, what are often called, um, you know, these externalities to what they're to what they're doing, right? Mm -hmm. um, because that's uh, for better or for worse, that's usually not in their scope. Um, so, for example. Um, earlier this fall, we um, released um, principles around cell-based meat and seafood because this is an emerging um, space in the food market um, that, uh, you know, many developers are calling, um, you know, this is going to be great uh, for the environment. It's going to provide healthier alternatives to conventional meat um, and so on. And, you know, the, the, the impetus is clear because cu with current food production, it accounts for one third of our global um, um, greenhouse gas emissions. And a big portion of that is um, animal protein, right? And so there, there, there is a strong case here, but um, when we talk about this new field, um, we need, uh, we do need more of a um, substantiation of um, mm -hmm. the benefits and a look at what could be the big impact because at the end of the day, as this, um, as a cell based um, meat and seafood um, mm -hmm. space grows, it could have huge implications for our global food system. 
And it's yeah. not just about, you know, how we create food today and distribute it and all the different, um, you know, uh, distribution channels there, but we're also talking about um, we're talking about millions of people who work in this system, right? We're talking about farmers, we're talking about ranchers, we're talking about um, fishermen. And so there's a huge, there's a huge impact there. On top of that, um, you know, as the, as the technologies are still being developed, there's also a question about what are the other inputs that are being used and what could that, what impact could that have on our health? Because we're looking at, you know, comparison to conventional meat, but there are other things that are part of the, um, you know, the process as, um, as these uh, developers are still working um, that we don't, we don't know if we, we don't know what we don't know about what their impacts could be on our health. And again, as they scale, this could have a huge um, impact on our, on people's diets. Um, and so, you know, so I think um, it's critical early on and what we've called for um, in the principles is not just for um, um, the technology developers as they're um, in their invention stage, but also looking at commercialization stage, not just to start baking in um, an, an, a true analysis and understanding of the um, environmental health and societal impacts of these products um, today and what they may be at scale, but to be doing this in concert with government agencies, mm -hmm. um, to be doing this in concert with uh, advocacy organizations who have a better understanding of what the community um, impacts could potentially be, um, and to um, be working with um, academics as well. And so that way you have um, experts for different pieces of this puzzle who are coming together to really think through what are the system changes that could occur and how do we make sure that we are heading more in a positive direction um, as opposed to um, potential, potential negative um, consequences. Fantastic. I'd like to, um, so Gary, I'd like to turn to you and I wanna pick up Bowen's point there about a system. We often talk about regulation in terms of individual tools or techniques or strategies. And I picked on co-design, co for example, one of the themes of the panel is thinking, we talked a lot about soft law and principles, but we've got to really remember, haven't we, that these are being developed and then uh, produced and performed and implemented in that system. So in all the work that you've been doing, I'm gonna ask you now to distill down 634 different case studies and 134 different criteria. Um, for some of the, the insights that you've gained in terms of, of what we can draw from all the analysis you've done in terms of how we can divine, design, devise an effective system for the regulation of emerging technologies in particular, when as Bona says, and, and as Kevin has also highlighted, we don't know what we don't know about these emerging technologies. So what can, what can we draw down? I'm going to ask you to distill your brain now and all your knowledge into about three minutes. Yeah, it's a, it's a tough assignment. But um, so, I mean, one thing is, you know, so we've been talking about anticipatory governance of, of yeah. being able to pay, but I think you have to pair that in a system with adaptive governance that when we're dealing with these complex technologies like living organisms or machine learning systems, you know, we can do the best we can to anticipate, but there's going to be surprises. And uh, when those surprises happen and they have a bad consequence, we have to be able to adapt very quickly. So I think we not only have to have the anticipatory up front, but the adaptive, once the systems are out there, the technology is out there, when things start to go wrong, to be able to move very quickly to try to uh, stem the, the harm and to build in resilience and so on. So I think those are the two parts of a governance system is anticipatory and adaptive together. Mm -hmm. um, and then just another one comment I just want to make is that, you know, a lot of people talk about soft laws that it's anti-democratic where we're, you know, we're, we're not relying on government, but mm -hmm. in the, the 630 soft law programs we looked at for AI, government was the number one participant in those. Government yeah. plays a role in many of these soft law programs as they should, as should the NGO community, as should industry, uh, as should academics and think tanks. And so, it, you know, bringing all those different, uh, inputs together, I think, as, as, as Bomo was saying, is really critical to have that multi-stakeholder engagement. Yeah, absolutely. But I was also really struck that when you said, I completely 
I think that's absolutely critical. And you, you, as, as you point out, soft law doesn't necessarily mean anti-democratic. It means it is a very, it's not, it's not to do with how it's formed, it's to do with the legal impacts that it has. But you were also, I was also struck when you said that two thirds of the systems that you looked at, okay, in the case of AI, had no process or no system for, for, for looking at implementation. Um, and so those, that, so those that did, let's look at those that did, what, what were some of the characteristics that we could draw? I'm gonna to turn to uh, Andrew and, and Stefan in a minute from a, from a more sort of governmental perspective. What are the kinds, of, so I know they're, they're waiting to hear your answer here, Gary. What kind of things can they, can they draw, can we draw from? Yeah. So I mean, there, there was a, a number of different tools in the ones that did have some kind of implementation. One is to have some kind of external ethics committee. Another one is have a partnership with someone like BOMA's organization that would sort of be a, a, a monitor. Uh, another one would be uh, external independent auditing. Uh, another one would be insurance companies who are uh, care about this because they don't want these long tail risks. So there's a, a number. Another one is a government off ramp that if you don't do this then the regulators will step in and put in place hard law. Uh, and so there's a number of different tools that can be built into the soft law program that I think help to make them more likely to be implemented than just simply announcing principles. Fascinating, fascinating. So Stefan, I want to turn to you now because from a, a regulator's perspective, I mean, this is, this is a, you know, it's a fast moving area. It's, it's very dynamic. And from your perspective, how, how much do you, how comp when do you feel confident, as it were, to, to let go? What kind of level of engagement at, at, and in what intensity do you feel you, you think governments need um, in this sort of myriad of different approaches that, that are being adopted? What do you find works particularly well? Um, yeah, I, I think the re reflecting on the, on the data um, Gary was referring to, I think it's, it depends very much on the, on the jurisdiction, on the system, whether um, government really participates in this type of, of soft law machinery. Um, there are different cultures, different opportunities. Um, and um, your, your opening question was how to, to get really the public engaged in, in, in this type of activity. And this is true for the government in a similar way. And this is uh, frankly and simply the question whether there is meaningful option for participation, for contributing. Mm -hmm. So if, if this is like, like a fig leaf, uh, you, you're invited to provide comments, but, but you have the gut feeling that the comments are not relevant at all, then it's not worth um, investing the time and, and the effort. So that, that's the, the proof is, um, do I have, um, is, is my uh, uh, contribution considered to be meaningful, to be relevant? And there is a, a movement and there, is, uh, there were examples from the science sector mm -hmm. under the title of um, um, citizen science, which, mm -hmm. which is extremely interesting mm -hmm. because um, citizen science could be interpreted in, okay, invite citizens to do the counting, the data collection. No? They, yeah. they should, they should yeah. collect the data and, and send it in. This is not really meaningful. Yeah. You will find people who do that, uh, yeah. who are motivated to do that. But in many, many cases, they, you will find this is kind of um, boring. Um, the, uh, the, the, this gold standard in citizen science is to invite citizens to um, participate in the um, research design. And this is a challenge to the researchers. Mm -hmm. And this, and there's a similar challenges to industry. So how, sh why should we industry with our legitimate interest, listen to citizens? There is a, there is a rationale in listening to consumers. Um, but, but this example, Julian, you have, mm -hmm. uh, you have provided, this is a challenge for an industry, uh, for the industry sector. And we have to admit there are different principles. Mm -hmm. So the principle of government is being public mm -hmm. with whatever you do. And the, and, the, and the fair principle for companies is that they are allowed to do what they want to do and that they are allowed to keep their knowledge for themselves 
and to make business out of the knowledge. And we need to bridge these uh, systemic uh, differences, but I think we are on a good way with companies um, who understand themselves as a public um, citizen. Perhaps. Um, yeah. Fantastic. And Julian, I saw you wanted to, to come in there. I just wondered if you wanted to, to, to respond with your own thoughts on, on that. No, no, no. I just wanted a compliment um, yeah. uh, to, to add as well that what we've noticed is above regulation, above self-regulation, above yeah. detailed protocol and principles. One of the way for success, and then I've seen that over the last 20 plus years in my career in the biopharmaceutical sector, is mm -hmm. corporate cultures. Mm -hmm. It's very important to understand that you can give as many rules, as many laws, as many principles, as many protocols as you want. You need to work on educating people on why that's important. What are the risks and the opportunity associated with the various technologies? And, and so that you can really literally build a moral compass for those people so they can navigate the gray. They can understand that what they do every day has an impact. They can challenge the status quo, et cetera. Otherwise, you know, it's, it's not normal human behavior and human nature, right? You might be pushed, you might have to, you know, cut a corner, et cetera. And so really work on the culture of ethics and particularly the culture of ethical innovation in the corporations, in the labs, in the academics, everywhere uh, where, you know, research and technology are being developed, designed, you know, manufactured and developed, and I think is essential. And the other is, is move away from strict control into principle-based approach, which, which I think is the future. It's more future-proof and allows us to really, through principle-based uh, approach, really set the framework so that we can navigate and, and, and try to achieve what Stefan was talking about, this natural innovation with the right mindset around it. So I think culture and principle-based uh, are, are essential to the future, especially where innovation is being designed. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic. So listen, everybody, we're, we're nearing the end of our time, but I do want to ask you um, what you think the key, we've covered such a lot of ground and we could cover so much more, but I want to ask you, what is the key message in the singular uh, that you would like the audience to take away from this panel and possibly for the OECD? What do you think um, you know, the OECD could, could draw from this or that you would really like people to take away from this? Um, so, Andrew, is it is it unfair to ask you to go first? <laughs> uh, no, I'm 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 the host, so you should feel free. I mean, I think the first thing I want to take away is the report card from Gary on how we're doing on our AI soft uh, principles. Love some feedback there and our implementation efforts. Um, to me, we got a lot of homework to do. I think to look at different dimensions of this. We've, we've explored a lot um, today. I was, I was taken by Kevin and some of his um, proposals about the peer review process and funding and publishing. But then I was listening to Stefan and he was talking about how the business community doesn't really get motivated by those same uh, reputational uh, honors. They're, they're after a different motivation, which is profit and they would consider a lot of those ideas intellectual property that they didn't want to share. And maybe that's a challenge to Julian about how we square that circle. Um, it, it's clear that I think we, let me just, you wanted one, one quick, quick answer. For, for me, it's about um, whether or not we need to split this by sectors, whether it's really different for digital versus health mm -hmm. versus others. And the other thing that, that I'm reeling with is just time frames. What yeah. is the future? How anticipatory do we need to get? How far upstream? Mm -hmm. And um, would we have known in 2003 that social media was going to turn out the way it has? Yeah. Okay. So, panelists, some additional questions for you to focus on there, which you're welcome to address uh, in your in your thoughts. Um, okay, Boma, let's turn to you. Sure. You know, I would say. Um, uh, when we're speaking about the environmental and health implications, especially in the product world, um, I, I, I think that one critical thing there to kind of consider is what's the impact of the downstream um, customer? And so I'm not just saying, I'm not saying the consumer per se, mm. but the downstream business customer, because they have a lot of influence. And honestly, um, a lot of my work has been in um, uh, encouraging and kind of guiding retailers, for example, to utilize their, to leverage their market power 
to have um, a say in um, how, you know, how technology developers are actually considering certain, um, uh, you know, unanticipated consequences. And one reason is that, um, you know, at the end of the day, they, they are ones that have a certain level of accountability or are starting to build in a certain level of accountability as they're trying to report back to their investors through their ESG reports on how they're doing, um, um, how they're doing in their regular um, corporate social or um, corporate sustainability reports as well. Um, and so there are those other mechanisms that I think can help build in um, some accountability further upstream because yeah. they, they um, more so than, um, than Venter, right, mm. have, they do have a reputation to protect. They yeah. do have um, consumer trust to, and loyalty to try and protect. And so they can be a helpful mechanism there in terms of trying to make sure that these questions um, are baked in as, um, as new um, technologies, um, new chemistries, um, new in innovations are coming mm -hmm. are coming online. So something to consider for the for the group and how to really incorporate mm -hmm. that um, more. Fantastic, thank you, uh, Julian. Let's turn to you next. Thank you. No, so I think the message, the key takeaway for me is you can count on the industry uh, to have a seat at the table to do the right thing to co-design, whether that's with health authority, government, patient, you know, providers, uh, academy, all of all of you guys. Uh, you know, we are uh, in the process of, you know, completely reorganizing how we operate. We're really now in the co-design phase. Uh, and, you know, we recently also revamped our code to move from a control-based environment to what we call the ethos, which is a set of principles that allow us to apply those principles across multiple areas, business integrity, bioethics, technoethics, and so on. There is a huge change. And, and that's my second takeaway. I think the industry that you know is not, you know, from, from the past is not the industry of today. You know, I've been there for 20 years. I'm, the, I'm a chief ethics and business integrity officer. Um, the heart of this industry, most employees I see, they wake up to do the right thing. They wake up to save patient lives. Uh, and, and I think that's also something which is important to convey. Uh, and the industry is, is there to transform the practice of medicine and definitely co-design is for us the, the, the way forward. We are actively engaged in doing this with multiple organizations uh, across the world. And we'd be delighted to continue to do that actively with OECD and many of the other partners around the table. Fantastic, thank you so much. Uh, Gary, can I turn to you next? Sure, so we're living in a time of just tremendous technology innovation. And for that technology to be successful and beneficial, we have to have governance that's equally innovative and changing. Mm -hmm. So just like we shouldn't rely on the technologies of the 70s of you know, coal fire, fire power plants and manual typewriters and one size fits all medicine, we shouldn't be relying on the governance mechanisms of the 70s exclusively. So we need to be able to innovate there as well. Mm -hmm. Fantastic, thank you so much. Uh, Stefan. Um, thank you, Julia. Um, I, I dare to provide two uh, takeaways. <laughs> the first is, um, uh, once again, uh, rec there is no need to have a regulation in place for any every single innovation. Yeah. Regulation is a general approach, and we just need to make sure that it uh, that it is effective. In whatever innovation is is going to come into the marketplace or into societies. Second takeaway: any regulation, you know, every every regulation, be it soft law, be it hard law, whatsoever, needs to be evidence based. Mm -hmm. Uh, needs to be comprehensible. Um, there needs to be a consultation process with those concerned behind that. And there needs to be a monitoring of outcomes to be yeah. adoptive and to follow up to real world development. Fantastic, thank you. So Andrew, just if, if you have any final, final thoughts and reflections from the incredibly, incredibly rich discussion. No, I, I, I think it's, um, I'd love to take Stefan offline a little bit and talk a little bit about regulation versus the soft law and, and what does the continuum there look like? And I think as Gary was referring, that's one of the things you can 
used to incentivize those people to adhere to soft law and, and make it real. So I think that is, uh, I think, something for us to work on back at the OECD across different directorates and committees. Um, no, I'm just very thankful for all the input we're receiving today, which we're, we're going to take back and figure out uh, how to go forward, which I understand is the next session uh, as, as, as well. But it comes at a very opportune time as we're thinking about our 23-24 program of work. Thank you all. Brilliant. Thank you so much. So listen, that's been incredibly rich and fertile discussion. I've absolutely loved it. I think we've covered a huge amount of ground. Um, and I think one of the things for me to take away is just the importance of thinking about that regulatory system, thinking about the different actors there are there, who can be who can be playing which role and how they then can be coordinated in a way that means that we can actually move forward rather than going around in ever rapid circles or ever decreasing circles. Um, but I think fantastic array. Thank you so much for all your, your deep engagement in this issue. Um, and as Andy said, the next session will be looking absolutely at uh, uh, the next steps that the OECD can be taking in this area. So thank you very much again. Thanks, Julia. Thank you, Julia. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much.